Chapter 18 A New Home for the Winter All Munkle had kept his word and was not spending the winter in his old home. As soon as the first snow began to fall, he had shut up the hut and the outside buildings and gone down to do a flea with Heidi and the goats. Near the church was a straggling half-ruined building, which had once been the home of a distinguished soldier. It was rented to poor people, who paid but a small sum, and when any part of the building fell it was allowed to remain. As soon as the grandfather had made up his mind to spend the winter in Duaflee, he rented the old place and worked during the autumn to get it sound and tight. In the middle of October he and Heidi took up their residence there. On approaching the house from the back one came first into an open space with a wall on either side, of which one was half in ruins. Above this rose the arch of an old window thickly overgrown with ivy, which spread over the remains of a domed roof that had evidently been part of a chapel. A large hall came next, which lay open, without doors, to the square outside. Here also walls and roof only partially remained, and indeed what was left of the roof looked as if it might fall at any minute had it not been for two stout pillars that supported it. All Munkle had here put up a wooden partition and covered the floor with straw, for this was to be the goat's house. Endless passages led from this, through the rents of which the sky as well as the fields and the road outside could be seen at intervals, but at last one came to a stout oak door that led into a room that still stood intact. Here the walls and the dark wainscoting remained as good as ever, and in the corner was an immense stove reaching nearly to the ceiling, on the white tiles of which were painted large pictures in blue. These represented old castles surrounded with trees, and huntsmen riding out with their hounds, or else a quiet lake scene, with broad oak trees and a man fishing. A seat ran all round the stove so that one could sit at one's ease and study the pictures. These attracted Heidi's attention at once, and she had no sooner arrived with her grandfather than she ran and seated herself and began to examine them. But when she had gradually worked herself round to the back, something else diverted her attention. In the large space between the stove and the wall four planks had been put together as if to make a large receptacle for apples, there were no apples, however, inside, but something Heidi had no difficulty in recognizing, for it was her very own bed, with its hay mattress and sheets, and sack for a cover lid, just as she had it up at the hut. Heidi clapped her hands for joy and exclaimed, Oh grandfather, this is my room, how nice. But where are you going to sleep? Your room must be near the stove or you will freeze, he replied, but you can come and see mine too. Heidi got down and skipped across the large room after her grandfather, who opened a door at the farther end leading into a smaller one which was to be his bedroom. Then came another door. Heidi pushed it open and stood amazed, for here was an immense room like a kitchen, larger than anything of the kind that Heidi had seen before. There was still plenty of work for the grandfather before this room could be finished, for there were holes and cracks in the walls through which the wind whistled and yet he had already nailed up so many new planks that it looked as if a lot of small cupboards had been set up round the room. He had, however, made the large, old door safe with many screws and nails as a protection against the outside air, and this was very necessary, for just beyond was a mass of ruined building overgrown with tall weeds, which made a dwelling place for innumerable beetles and lizards. Heidi was very delighted with her new home, and by the morning after their arrival she knew every nook and corner so thoroughly that she could take Peter over it and show him all that was to be seen, indeed she would not let him go till he had examined every single wonderful thing contained in it. Heidi slept soundly in her corner by the stove, but every morning when she first awoke she still thought she was on the mountain, and that she must run outside at once to see if the fir trees were so quiet because their branches were way down with the thick snow. She had to look about her for some minutes before she felt quite sure where she was, and a certain sensation of trouble and oppression would come over her as she grew aware that she was not at home in the hut. But then she would hear her grandfather's voice outside, attending to the goats, and these would give one or two loud bleats, as if calling to her to make haste and go to them, and then Heidi was happy again, for she knew she was still at home and she would jump gladly out of bed and run out to the animals as quickly as she could. On the fourth morning, as soon as she saw her grandfather, 
she said, I must go up to see grandmother today, she ought not to be alone so long. But the grandfather would not agree to this. Neither today nor tomorrow can you go, he said, the mountain is covered fathom deep in snow, and the snow is still falling, the sturdy Peter can hardly get along. A little creature like you would soon be smothered by it, and we should not be able to find you again. Wait a bit till it freezes, then you will be able to walk over the hard snow. Heidi now went to school in dutifully and eagerly set to work to learn all that was taught her. She hardly ever saw Peter there, for as a rule he was absent. The teacher was an easy-going man who merely remarked now and then, Peter is not turning up today again, it seems, but there is a lot of snow up on the mountain and I dare say he cannot get along. Peter, however, always seemed able to make his way through the snow in the evening when school was over, and he then generally paid Heidi a visit. At last, after some days, when Peter climbed out of his window one morning, the door was quite blocked by the snow outside, he was taken by surprise, for instead of sinking into the snow he fell on the hard ground and went sliding some way down the mountainside like a sleigh, before he could stop himself. He picked himself up and tested the hardness of the ground by stamping on it and trying with all his might to dig his heels into it, but even then he could not break off a single little splinter of ice, the olm was frozen hard as iron. This was just what Peter had been hoping for, as he knew now that Heidi would be able to come up to see them. He quickly got back into the house, swallowed the milk which his mother had ready for him, thrust a piece of bread in his pocket, and said, I must be off to school, and in another minute was shooting down the mountain on his sled. He went like lightning, and when he reached Dewarfly, which stood on the direct road to Menfeld, he made up his mind to go on further. So down he still went till he reached the level ground, where the sled came to a pause of its own accord, some a little way beyond Menfeld. He knew it was too late to get to school now, as lessons would already have begun, and it would take him a good hour to walk back to Dewarfly. So he took his time about returning, and reached Dewarfly just as Heidi had got home from school and was sitting at dinner with her grandfather. Peter walked in, exclaiming as he stood still in the middle of the room, she's got it now. Got it? What? asked the uncle. Your words sound quite warlike, General. The frost, explained Peter. Oh, now I can go and see Grandmother, said Heidi joyfully, for she had understood Peter's words at once. But why were you not at school then? You could have come down on the sled, she added reproachfully for it did not agree with Heidi's ideas of good behavior to stay away when it was possible to be there. It carried me on too far and I was too late, Peter replied. I call that being a deserter, said the uncle, and deserters get their ears pulled, as you know. Peter gave a tug to his cap in alarm, for there was no one of whom he stood in so much awe as all uncle. And an army leader like yourself ought to be doubly ashamed of running away, continued all uncle. What would you think of your goats if one went off this way and another that, and refused to follow and do what was good for them? What would you do then? I should beat them, said Peter promptly. And if a boy behaved like these unruly goats, and he got a beating for it, what would you say then? Serves him right, was the answer. Good, then understand this, next time you let your sled carry you past the school when you ought to be inside at your lessons, come on to me afterwards and receive what you deserve. Peter understood the drift of the old man's questions and that he was the boy who behaved like the unruly goats, and he looked somewhat fearfully towards the corner to see if there happened to be a stick around. But now the grandfather suddenly said in a cheerful voice, come and sit down and have something, and afterwards Heidi shall go with you. Bring her back this evening and you will find supper waiting for you here. This unexpected turn of conversation set Peter grinning all over with delight. He obeyed without hesitation and took his seat beside Heidi. But the child could not eat in her excitement at the thought of going to see grandmother. She ran to the cupboard and brought out the warm cloak Clara had sent her, with this on and the hood drawn over her head, she was all ready for her journey. She stood waiting beside Peter, and as soon as his last mouthful had disappeared she said, Come along now. 
As the two walked together Heidi had much to tell Peter of her two goats that had been so unhappy the first day in their new stall that they would not eat anything, but stood hanging their heads, not even rousing themselves to bleat. And when she asked her grandfather the reason of this, he told her it was the same with the goats as with her in Frankfurt, for it was the first time in their lives they had come down from the mountain. And you don't know what that is, Peter, unless you have felt it yourself, added Heidi. When they reached their destination they found Brigitte sitting alone knitting, for the grandmother was not very well and had to stay in bed on account of the cold. Heidi had never before missed the old figure in her place in the corner, and she ran quickly into the next room. There lay grandmother on her little, poorly covered bed, wrapped up in her warm grey shawl. Thank God, she exclaimed as Heidi came running in, the poor old woman had had a secret fear at heart all through the autumn, especially if Heidi was absent for any length of time, for Peter had told her of a strange gentleman who had come from Frankfurt and who had gone out with them and always talked to Heidi, and she had felt sure he had come to take her away again. Even when she heard he had gone off alone, she still had an idea that a messenger would be sent over from Frankfurt to take the child. Heidi went up to the side of the bed and said, Are you very ill, grandmother? No, no, child, answered the old woman reassuringly, passing her hand lovingly over the child's head it's only the frost that has got into my bones a bit. Shall you be quite well then directly it turns warm again? Yes, God willing, or even before that, for I want to get back to my spinning, I thought perhaps I should do a little today, but tomorrow I am sure to be all right again. Heidi noticed that the grandmother was wrapped up in her nice shawl and exclaimed, in Frankfurt everybody puts on a shawl to go out walking, did you think it was to be worn in bed? grandmother I put it on, dear child, to keep myself from freezing, and I am so pleased with it, for my bedclothes are not very thick, she answered. But, grandmother, continued Heidi, your bed is not right, because it goes downhill at your head instead of uphill. I know it, child, I can feel it, and the grandmother put up her hand to the thin, flat pillow, which was little more than a board under her head, to make herself more comfortable, the pillow was never very thick, and I have lain on it now for so many years that it has grown quite flat. Oh, if only I had asked Clara to let me take away my Frankfurt bed, said Heidi. I had three large pillows, one above the other, so that I could hardly sleep, and I used to slip down to try and find a flat place, and then I had to pull myself up again, because it was proper to sleep there like that. Could you sleep like that? grandmother? Oh, yes. The pillows keep one warm, and it is easier to breathe when the head is high, answered the grandmother. But we will not talk about that, for I have so much that other old sick people are without for which I thank God, there is the nice bread I get every day, and this warm wrap, and your visits, Heidi. Will you read me something today? Heidi ran into the next room to get the hymn book. Then she picked out the favorite hymns one after another, for she knew them all by heart now, and was as pleased as the grandmother to hear them again after so many days. The grandmother lay with folded hands, while a smile of peace stole over the worn, troubled face, like one to whom good news has been brought. Suddenly Heidi paused. Grandmother, are you feeling quite well again already? Yes, child, I have grown better while listening to you read it to the end. The child read on, and when she came to the last words. As the eyes grow dim, and darkness closes round, the soul grows clearer, sees the goal to which it travels, gladly feels its home is nearer. The grandmother repeated them once or twice to herself, with a look of happy expectation on her face. And Heidi took equal pleasure in them, for the picture of the beautiful, sunny day of her return home rose before her eyes, and she exclaimed joyfully, Grandmother, I know exactly what it is like to go home. A little later Heidi said, It is growing dark and I must go, I am so glad to think that you are quite well again. She ran into the next room, and bid Peter come quickly, for it had now grown quite dark. But when they got outside they found the moon shining down on the white snow and everything as clear as in the daylight. Peter got his sled, put Heidi at the back, he himself sitting in front to guide, 
and down the mountain they shot like two birds darting through the air. When Heidi was lying that night on her high bed of hay, she thought of the grandmother on her low pillow, and of all she had said about the light and comfort that awoke in her when she heard the hymns, and she thought, if I could read to her every day, then I should go on making her better. But she knew that it would be a week, if not two, before she would be able to go up the mountain again. This was a thought of great trouble to Heidi, and she tried hard to think of some way which would enable the grandmother to hear the words she loved every day. Suddenly an idea struck her, and she was so delighted with it that she could hardly bear to wait for morning, so eager was she to begin carrying out her plan. All at once she sat upright in her bed, for she had been so busy with her thoughts that she had forgotten to say her prayers, and she never now finished her day without saying them. When she had prayed with all her heart for herself, her grandfather and grandmother, she lay back again on the warm, soft hay and slept soundly and peacefully till the morning broke. Chapter 19 Heidi Teaches Obstinate Peter Peter arrived punctually at school the following day. He had brought his dinner with him, for all the children who lived at a distance regularly seated themselves at midday on the tables, and resting their feet firmly on the benches, spread out their meal on their knees and so ate their dinner, while those living in Duaflee went home for theirs. Till one o'clock they might all do as they liked, and then school began again. As soon as Peter finished his lessons he went over to Uncle's to see Heidi. When he walked into the large room at Uncle's today, Heidi immediately rushed forward and took hold of him and said, I've thought of something, Peter. What is it? he asked. You must learn to read, she informed him. I have learnt, was the answer. Yes, yes, but I mean so that you can really make use of it, continued Heidi eagerly. I never shall, was the prompt reply. Nobody believes that you cannot learn, nor I either now, said Heidi in a very decided tone of voice. Grandmama in Frankfurt said long ago that it was not true, and she told me not to believe you. Peter looked rather taken aback at this piece of intelligence. I will soon teach you to read, for I know how, continued Heidi. You must learn at once, and then you can read one or two hymns every day to grandmother. Oh, I don't care about that, he grumbled in reply. This hard-hearted way of refusing to agree to what was right and kind, and to what Heidi had so much at heart, aroused her anger. With flashing eyes she stood facing the boy and said threateningly, If you won't learn as I want you to, I will tell you what will happen, you know your mother has often spoken of sending you to Frankfurt, that you may learn a lot of things, and I know where the boys there have to go to school, Clara pointed out the great house to me when we were driving together. And they don't only go when they are boys, but have more lessons still when they are grown men. I have seen them myself, and you mustn't think they have only one kind teacher like we have. There are ever so many of them, all in the school at the same time, and they are all dressed in black, as if they were going to church, and have black hats on their heads as high as that, and Heidi held out her hand to show their height from the floor. Peter felt a cold shudder run down his back. And you will have to go in among all those gentlemen, continued Heidi with increasing animation, and when it comes to your turn you won't be able to read and will make mistakes in your spelling. Then you'll see how they'll make fun of you, even worse than Tinette, and you ought to have seen what she was like when she was scornful. Well, I'll learn then, said Peter, half sorrowfully and half angrily. Heidi was instantly mollified. That's right, then we'll begin at once, she said cheerfully. Among other presents Clara had sent Heidi a book which the latter had decided would be just the thing for teaching Peter, as it was an ABC book with rhyming lines. So the two sat together at the table with their heads bent over the book, and began the lesson. Peter was made to spell out the first sentence two or three times over, for Heidi wished him to get it correct and fluent. At last she said, you don't seem able to get it right, but I will read it aloud to you once when you know what it ought to be you will find it easier. And she read out. ABC must be learned today. Or the judge will call you up to pay. I shan't go, said Peter obstinately. Go where? asked Heidi. Before the judge, he answered. Well then make haste and learn these three letters, then you won't have to go. 
Peter went at his task again and repeated the three letters so many times and with such determination that she said at last. You must know those three now. Seeing what an effect the first two lines of verse had had upon him, she thought she would prepare the ground a little for the following lessons. Wait, and I will read you some of the next sentences, she continued, then you will see what else there is to expect. And she began in a clear slow voice. DEFG must run with ease or something will follow that does not please. Should HIJK be now forgot disgrace is yours upon the spot. And then LM must follow at once or punished you'll be for a sorry dance. If you knew what next awaited you you'd haste to learn NOPQ. Now RST be quick about or worse will follow there's little doubt. Heidi paused, for Peter was so quiet that she looked to see what he was doing. These many secret threats and hints of dreadful punishments had so affected him that he sat as if petrified and stared at Heidi with horror-stricken eyes. Her kind heart was moved at once, and she said, wishing to reassure him, You need not be afraid, Peter, come here to me every evening, and if you learn as you have today you will at least know all your letters, and the other things won't come. But you must come regularly, not only now and then as you do to school, even if it snows it won't hurt you. He promised, and the lessons being finished for this day he now went home. Peter obeyed Heidi's instructions punctually, and every evening went diligently to work to learn the letters, taking the sentences thoroughly to heart. The grandfather was frequently in the room smoking his pipe comfortably while the lesson was going on, and his face twitched occasionally as if he was overtaken with a sudden fit of merriment. Peter was often invited to stay to supper after the great exertion he had gone through which richly compensated him for the anguish of mind he had suffered with the sentence for the day. So the winter went by, and Peter really made progress with his letters, but he went through a terrible fight each day with the sentences. He had got at last to U. Heidi read out. And if you put the U for V. You'll go where you would not like to be. Peter growled, yes, but I shan't go. But he was very diligent that day as if under the impression that someone would seize him suddenly by the collar and drag him where he would rather not go. The next evening Heidi read. If you falter at W, worst of all. Look at the stick against the wall. Peter looked at the wall and said scornfully, there isn't one. Yes, but do you know what grandfather has in his box? asked Heidi. A stick as thick almost as your arm, and if he took that out, you might well say, look at the stick on the wall. Peter knew that thick hazel stick, and immediately bent his head over the W and struggled to master it. Another day the lines ran. Then comes the X for you to say. Or be sure you'll get no food today. Peter looked towards the cupboard where the bread and cheese were kept, and said crossly, I never said that I should forget the X. That's all right, if you don't forget it we can go on to learn the next, and then you will only have one more replied Heidi, anxious to encourage him. Peter did not quite understand, but when Heidi went on and read. And should you make a stop at Y? They'll point at you and cry, fie, fie. All the gentlemen in Frankfurt with tall black hats on their heads, and scorn and mockery in their faces rose up before his mind's eye, and he threw himself with energy on the Y not letting it go till at last he knew it so thoroughly that he could see what it was like even when he shut his eyes. He arrived on the following day in a somewhat lofty frame of mind, for there was now only one letter to struggle over, and when Heidi began the lesson with reading aloud. Make haste with Z, if you're too slow. Off to the hot and tots you'll go. Peter remarked scornfully, I dare say, when no one knows even where such people live. I assure you, Peter, replied Heidi, Grandfather knows all about them. Wait a second and I will run and ask him, for he is only over the way with the pastor. And she rose and ran to the door to put her words into action, but Peter cried out in a voice of agony. Stop! For he already saw himself being carried off by all Uncle and the pastor and sent straight away to the Hottentots, since as yet he did not know his last letter. His cry of fear brought Heidi back. What is the matter? She asked in astonishment. Nothing. Come back. I am going to learn my letter, 
he said, stammering with fear. Heidi, however, herself wished to know where the Hottentots lived and persisted that she should ask her grandfather, but she gave in at last to Peter's despairing entreaties. She insisted on his doing something in return, and so not only had he to repeat his Z until it was so fixed in his memory that he could never forget it again, but she began teaching him to spell, and Peter really made a good start that evening. So it went on from day to day. The frost had gone and the snow was soft again, and moreover fresh snow continually fell, so that it was quite three weeks before Heidi could go to the grandmother again. So much the more eagerly did she pursue her teaching so that Peter might compensate for her absence by reading hymns to the old woman. One evening he walked in home after leaving Heidi, and as he entered he said, I can do it now. Do what, Peter? asked his mother. Read, he answered. Do you really mean it? Did you hear that, grandmother? she called out. The grandmother had heard, and was already wondering how such a thing could have come to pass. I must read one of the hymns now, Heidi told me to, he went on to inform them. His mother hastily brought the book, and the grandmother lay in joyful expectation, for it was so long since she had heard the good words. Peter sat down to the table and began to read. His mother sat beside him listening with surprise and exclaiming at the close of each verse, who would have thought it possible. The grandmother did not speak though she followed the words he read with strained attention. It happened on the day following this that there was a reading lesson in Peter's class. When it came to his turn, the teacher said. We must pass over Peter as usual, or will you try again once more, I will not say to read, but to stammer through a sentence. Peter took the book and read off three lines without the slightest hesitation. The teacher put down his book and stared at Peter as at some out of the way and marvelous thing unseen before. At last he spoke. Peter, some miracle has been performed upon you. Here have I been striving with unheard of patience to teach you and you have not hitherto been able to say your letters even. And now, just as I had made up my mind not to waste any more trouble upon you, you suddenly are able to read a whole sentence properly and distinctly. How has such a miracle come to pass in our days? It was Heidi, answered Peter. The teacher looked in astonishment towards Heidi, who was sitting innocently on her bench with no appearance of anything supernatural about her. He continued, I have noticed a change in you altogether, Peter. Whereas formerly you often missed coming to school for a week, or even weeks at a time, you have lately not stayed away a single day. Who has wrought this change for good in you? It was uncle, answered Peter. With increasing surprise the teacher looked from Peter to Heidi and back again at Peter. We will try once more, he said cautiously, and Peter had again to show off his accomplishment by reading another three lines. There was no mistake about it, Peter could read. As soon as school was over the teacher went over to the pastor to tell him this piece of news, and to inform him of the happy result of Heidi's and the grandfather's combined efforts. Every evening Peter read one hymn aloud, so far he obeyed Heidi. Nothing would induce him to read a second, and indeed the grandmother never asked for it. His mother Brigitte could not get over her surprise at her son's attainment, and when the reader was in bed would often express her pleasure at it. Now he has learnt to read there is no knowing what may be made of him yet. On one of these occasions the grandmother answered, Yes, it is good for him to have learnt something, but I shall indeed be thankful when spring is here again and Heidi can come, they are not like the same hymns when Peter reads them. So many words seem missing, and I try to think what they ought to be and then I lose the sense, and so the hymns do not come home to my heart as when Heidi reads them. The truth was that Peter arranged to make his reading as little troublesome for himself as possible. When he came upon a word that he thought was too long or difficult in any other way, he left it out, for he decided that a word or two less in a verse, where there were so many of them, could make no difference to his grandmother. And so it came about that most of the principal words were missing in the hymns that Peter read aloud. Chapter 20 A Strange Looking Procession it was the month of May. The clear, warm sunshine lay upon the mountain, which had turned green again. 
The last snows had disappeared and the sun had already coaxed many of the flowers to show their bright heads above the grass. Heidi was at home again on the mountain, running backwards and forwards in her accustomed way, not knowing which spot was most delightful. From the shed at the back came the sound of sawing and chopping, and Heidi listened to it with pleasure, for it was the old familiar sound she had known from the beginning of her life up here. Suddenly she jumped up and ran round, for she must know what her grandfather was doing. In front of the shed door already stood a finished new chair, and a second was in course of construction under the grandfather's skillful hand. Oh, I know what these are for, exclaimed Heidi in great glee. We shall want them when they all come from Frankfurt. This one is for Grandmama, and the one you are now making is for Clara, and then, then there will, I suppose, have to be another, continued Heidi with more hesitation in her voice, or do you think, Grandfather, that perhaps Miss Rotemeyer will not come with them? Well, I cannot say just yet, replied her grandfather, but it will be safer to make one so that we can offer her a seat if she does. While talking with the grandfather there was heard from above a whistling and calling which Heidi immediately recognized. She ran out and found herself surrounded by her four-footed friends. They were apparently as pleased as she was to be among the heights again, for they leapt about and bleated for joy. When Peter at last got up to her he handed her a letter. There! he exclaimed. Did someone give you this while you were out with the goats? she asked, in her surprise. No, was the answer. Where did you get it from then? I found it in the dinner bag. Which was true to a certain extent. The letter to Heidi had been given him the evening before by the postman at Dewarfly, and Peter had put it into his empty bag. That morning he had stuffed his bread and cheese on the top of it, and had forgotten it when he called for all Munkle's two goats, only when he had finished his bread and cheese at midday and was searching in the bag for any last crumbs did he remember the letter which lay at the bottom. Heidi read the address carefully, then she ran back to the shed holding out her letter to her grandfather in high glee. From Frankfurt. From Clara. Would you like to hear it? The grandfather was ready and pleased to do so, as was Peter, who had followed Heidi into the shed. Dearest Heidi, everything is packed and we shall start now in two or three days, as soon as Papa himself is ready to leave, he is not coming with us as he has first to go to Paris. The doctor comes every day, and as soon as he is inside the door, he cries, off now as quickly as you can, off to the mountain. He is most impatient about our going. You cannot think how much he enjoyed himself when he was with you. He has called nearly every day this winter, and each time he describes over again all he did with you and the grandfather, and talks of the mountains and the flowers and of the great silence up there far above all towns and villages, and of the fresh, delicious air, and often adds, no one can help getting well up there. He himself is quite a different man since his visit, and looks happy again. Oh. How I am looking forward to seeing everything and to being with you on the mountain, and to making the acquaintance of Peter and the goats. I shall have first to go through a six weeks cure at regards, this the doctor has ordered, and then we shall move up to Dewarfly, and every fine day I shall be carried up the mountain in my chair and spend the day with you. Grandmama is travelling with me and will remain with me, she also is delighted at the thought of paying you a visit. But just imagine, Miss Rotemeyer refuses to come with us. Almost every day Grandmama says to her, Well, how about this Swiss journey, my worthy Rotemeyer? Pray say if you really would like to come with us. But she always thanks Grandmama very politely and says she has quite made up her mind. I think I know what has done it, Sebastian gave such a frightful description of the mountain, of how the rocks were so overhanging and dangerous that at any minute you might fall into a crevasse, and how it was such steep climbing that you feared at every step to go slipping to the bottom, and that goats alone could make their way up without fear of being killed. She shuddered when she heard him tell of all this, and since then she has not been so enthusiastic about Switzerland as she was before. Fear has also taken possession of Tinette, and she also refuses to come. So Grandmama and I will be alone, Sebastian will go with us as far as regards and then return here. I can hardly bear waiting till I see you again. Goodbye, dearest Heidi, 
Grandmama sends you her best love and all good wishes. Your affectionate friend, Clara. As soon as the letter had been read, Peter rushed out, twirling his stick in the air in such a reckless fashion that the frightened goats fled down the mountain before him with higher and wider leaps than usual. He followed at full speed, his stick still raised in air in a menacing manner as if he was longing to vent his fury on some invisible foe. This foe was indeed the prospect of the arrival of the Frankfurt visitors, the thought of whom filled him with exasperation. Heidi was so full of joyful anticipation that she determined to seize the first possible moment next day to go down and tell grandmother who was coming, and also particularly who was not coming. The old lady was no longer confined to her bed. She was back in her corner at her spinning wheel, but there was an expression on her face of mournful anxiety. Peter had come in the evening before, brimful of anger and had told about the large party who were coming up from 180, Frankfurt, and he did not know what other things might happen after that, and the old woman had not slept all night, pursued by the old thought of Heidi being taken from her. Heidi ran in, and taking her little stool immediately sat down by grandmother and began eagerly pouring out all her news, growing more excited with her pleasure as she went on. But all of a sudden she stopped short and said anxiously, What is the matter, grandmother, aren't you a bit pleased with what I am telling you? Yes, yes, of course, child, since it gives you so much pleasure, she answered, trying to look more cheerful. But I can see all the same that something troubles you. Is it because you think after all that Miss Rotomeyer may come? asked Heidi, beginning to feel anxious herself. No, no. It is nothing, child, said the grandmother, wishing to reassure her. Just give me your hand that I may feel sure you are there. No doubt it would be the best thing for you, although I feel I could scarcely survive it. I do not want anything of the best if you could scarcely survive it, said Heidi, in such a determined tone of voice that the grandmother's fears increased as she felt sure the people from Frankfurt were coming to take Heidi back with them, since now she was well again they naturally wished to have her with them once more. But she was anxious to hide her trouble from Heidi if possible, as the latter was so sympathetic that she might refuse perhaps to go away, and that would not be right. Heidi, she said, there is something that would comfort me and calm my thoughts, read me the hymn beginning, all things will work for good. Heidi found the place at once and read out in her clear, young voice. All things will work for good. To those who trust in me. I come with healing on my wings. To save and set thee free. Yes, yes, that is just what I wanted to hear, said the grandmother and the deep expression of trouble passed from her face. Heidi looked at her thoughtfully for a minute or two and then said, Healing means that which cures everything and makes everybody well, doesn't it, grandmother? Yes, that is it, replied the old woman with a nod of assent, and we may be sure everything will come to pass according to God's good purpose. When the evening came, Heidi returned home up the mountain. The stars came out overhead one by one, so bright and sparkling that each seemed to send a fresh ray of joy into her heart. Not only were the nights of this month of May so clear and bright, but the days as well, the sun rose every morning into the cloudless sky, as undimmed in its splendor as when it sank the evening before, and the grandfather would look out early and exclaim with astonishment, This is indeed a wonderful year of sun, it will make all the shrubs and plants grow apace. You will have to see, General, that your army does not get out of hand from overfeeding. And Peter would swing his stick with an air of assurance and an expression on his face as much as to say, I'll see to that. So May passed, everything growing greener and greener, and then came the month of June, with a hotter sun and long, light days, that brought the flowers out all over the mountain, so that every spot was bright with them and the air full of their sweet scents. This month too was drawing to its close when one day Heidi, having finished her household duties, ran out with the intention of paying first a visit to the fir trees, and then going up higher to see if the bush of rock roses was yet in bloom, for its flowers were so lovely when standing open in the sun. But just as she was turning the corner of the hut, she gave such a loud cry that her grandfather came running out of the shed to see what had happened. Grandfather, Grandfather! she cried, beside herself with excitement. 
Come here. Look. Look. The old man was by her side by this time and looked in the direction of her outstretched hand. A strange-looking procession was making its way up the mountain, in front were two men carrying a sedan chair, in which sat a girl well wrapped up in shawls, then followed a horse, mounted by a stately-looking lady who was looking about her with great interest and talking to the guide who walked beside her, then a reclining chair, which was being pushed up by another man, it having evidently been thought safer to send the invalid to whom it belonged up the steep path in a sedan chair. The procession wound up with a porter, with such a bundle of cloaks, shawls, and furs on his back that it rose well above his head. Here they come, here they come, shouted Heidi, jumping with joy. And sure enough it was the party from Frankfurt, the figures came nearer and nearer, and at last they had actually arrived. The men in front put down their burden, Heidi rushed forward and the two children embraced each other with mutual delight. Grandmama having also reached the top, dismounted, and gave Heidi an affectionate greeting, before turning to the grandfather, who had meanwhile come up to welcome his guests. There was no constraint about the meeting, for they both knew each other perfectly well from hearsay and felt like old acquaintances. After the first words of greeting had been exchanged Grandmama broke out into lively expressions of admiration. What a magnificent residence you have! Uncle. I could hardly have believed it was so beautiful. A king might well envy you. And how well my little Heidi looks, like a wild rose. She continued, drawing the child towards her and stroking her fresh pink cheeks. I don't know which way to look first, it is all so lovely. What do you say to it, Clara, what do you say? Clara was gazing round entranced, she had never imagined, much less seen, anything so beautiful. She gave vent to her delight in cries of joy. Oh grandmama, she said, I should like to remain here forever. The grandfather had meanwhile drawn up the invalid chair and spread some of the wraps over it, he now went up to Clara. Supposing we carry the little daughter now to her accustomed chair, I think she will be more comfortable, the travelling sedan is rather hard he said, and without waiting for anyone to help him he lifted the child in his strong arms and laid her gently down on her own couch. He then covered her over carefully and arranged her feet on the soft cushion, as if he had never done anything all his life but wait on cripples. The grandmama looked on with surprise. My dear uncle, she exclaimed, if I knew where you had learned to nurse I would at once send all the nurses I know to the same place that they might handle their patients in like manner. How do you come to know so much? Uncle smiled. I know more from experience than training, he answered, but as he spoke the smile died away and a look of sadness passed over his face. The vision rose before him of a face of suffering that he had known long years before, the face of a man lying crippled on his couch of pain, and unable to move a limb. The man had been his captain during the fierce fighting in Sicily, he had found him lying 184, wounded and had carried him away, and after that the captain would suffer no one else near him, and uncle had stayed and nursed him till his sufferings ended in death. It all came back to uncle now, and it seemed natural to him to attend the sick Clara and to show her all those kindly attentions with which he had once been so familiar. Oh Heidi, if only I could walk about with you, said Clara longingly, if I could but go and look at the fir trees and at everything I know so well from your description, although I have never been here before. Heidi in response put out all her strength, and after a slight effort, managed to wheel Clara's chair quite easily round the hut to the fir trees. There they paused. Clara had never seen such trees before, with their tall, straight stems, and long, thick branches growing thicker and thicker till they touched the ground. Even the grandmama, who had followed the children, was astonished at the sight of them. Heidi had now wheeled Clara toward the goat shed, and had flung open the door, so that Clara might have a full view of the inside. Clara lamented to her grandmother that they would have to leave early before the goats came home. I should so like to have seen Peter and his whole flock. Oh, the flowers! exclaimed Clara. Look at the bushes of red flowers, and all the nodding blue bells. Oh, if I could but get out and pick some. Heidi ran off at once and picked her a large nosegay of them. 
but these are nothing, Clara, she said, laying the flowers on her lap. If you could come up higher to where the goats are feeding, then you would indeed see something. Bushes on bushes of the red century, and ever so many more of the blue bell flowers, and then the bright yellow rock roses, that gleam like pure gold, and all crowding together in the one spot. And then there are others with the large leaves that grandfather calls bright eyes, and the brown ones with little round heads that smell so delicious. Oh, it is beautiful up there, and if you sit down among them you never want to get up again, everything looks and smells so lovely. Heidi's eyes sparkled with the remembrance of what she was describing, she was longing herself to see it all again, and Clara caught her enthusiasm and looked back at her with equal longing in her soft blue eyes. Grandmama, do you think I could get up there? Is it possible for me to go? She asked eagerly. If only I could walk, climb about everywhere with you, Heidi. I am sure I could push you up, the chair goes so easily, said Heidi, and in proof of her words, she sent the chair at such a pace round the corner that it nearly went flying down the mountainside. Grandmama being at hand, however, stopped it in time. The grandfather, meantime, had not been idle. He had by this time put the table and extra chairs in front of the seat, so that they might all sit out here and eat the dinner that was preparing inside. The milk and the cheese were soon ready, and then the company sat down in high spirits to their midday meal. Grandmama was enchanted, as the doctor had been, with their dining room, whence one could see far along the valley, and far over the mountains to the farthest stretch of blue sky. A light wind blew refreshingly over them as they sat at table, and the rustling of the fir trees made a festive accompaniment to the repast. I never enjoyed anything as much as this. It is really superb, cried Grandmama two or three times over, and then suddenly in a tone of surprise, do I really see you taking a second piece of toasted cheese, Clara? There, sure enough, was a second golden-colored slice of cheese on Clara's plate. Oh, it does taste so nice, Grandmama, better than all the dishes we have at regards, replied Clara, as she continued eating with appetite. That's right, eat what you can exclaimed uncle. It's the mountain air, which makes up for the deficiencies of the kitchen. And so the meal went on. Grandmama and all uncle got on very well together, and their conversation became more and more lively. They were so thoroughly agreed in their opinions of men and things and the world in general that they might have been taken for old cronies. The time passed merrily, and then Grandmama looked towards the west and said. We must soon get ready to go, Clara, the sun is a good way down, the men will be here directly with the horse and sedan. Clara's face fell, and she said beseechingly, Oh, just another hour, Grandmama, or two hours. We haven't seen inside the hut yet, or Heidi's bed, or any of the other things. If only the day was ten hours long. Well, that is not possible, said Grandmama but she herself was anxious to see inside the hut, so they all rose from the table and uncle wheeled Clara's chair to the door. But there they came to a standstill, for the chair was much too broad to pass through the door. Uncle, however, soon settled the difficulty by lifting Clara in his strong arms and carrying her inside. Grandmama went all round and examined the household arrangements and was very much amused and pleased at their orderliness and the cosy appearance of everything. And this is your bedroom up here, Heidi, is it not? She asked, as without fear she mounted the ladder to the hayloft. Oh, it does smell sweet, what a healthy place to sleep in. She went up to the round window and looked out, and grandfather followed up with Clara in his arms, Heidi springing up after them. Then they all stood and examined Heidi's wonderful hay bed and Grandmama looked thoughtfully at it and drew in from time to time fragrant draughts of the hay-perfumed air, while Clara was charmed beyond words with the sleeping apartment. It is delightful for you up here, Heidi. You can look from your bed straight into the sky, and then such a delicious smell all round you. And outside the fir trees waving and rustling. I have never seen such a pleasant, cheerful bedroom before. Uncle looked across at the Grandmama. I have been thinking, he said to her, that if you were willing to agree to it, your little granddaughter might remain up here, and I am sure she would grow stronger. 
you have brought up all kinds of shawls and covers with you, and we could make up a soft bed out of them, and as to looking after the child, you need have no fear, for I will see to that. Clara and Heidi were as overjoyed at these words as if they were two birds let out of their cages, and Grandmama's face beamed with satisfaction. You are indeed kind, my dear uncle, she exclaimed. I was just thinking myself that a stay up here might be the very thing she wanted. But then the trouble, the inconvenience to yourself. And you speak of nursing and looking after her as if it were a mere nothing. I thank you sincerely, I thank you from my whole heart, uncle. And she took his hand and gave it a long and grateful shake, which he returned with a pleased expression of countenance. Uncle immediately set to work to get things ready. He carried Clara back to her chair outside, Heidi following, not knowing how to jump high enough into the air to express her contentment. Then he gathered up a whole pile of shawls and furs and said, smiling, it is a good thing that Grandmama came up well provided for a winter's campaign, we shall be able to make good use of these. The two had meanwhile ascended to the hayloft and begun to prepare a bed, there were so many articles piled one over the other that when finished it looked like a regular little fortress. Grandmama passed her hand carefully over it to make sure that there were no bits of hay sticking out. If there's a bit that can come through it will, she said. The soft mattress, however, was so smooth and thick that nothing could penetrate it. Then they went down again well satisfied and found the children laughing and talking together and arranging all they were going to do from morning till evening as long as Clara stayed. The next question was how long she was to remain, and first Grandmama was asked, but she referred them to the grandfather, who gave it as his opinion that she ought to make trial of the mountain air for at least a month. The children clapped their hands for joy, for they had not expected to be together for so long a time. The bearers and the horse and guide were now seen approaching, the former were sent back at once, and Grandmama prepared to mount for her return journey. It's not saying goodbye, Grandmama, Clara called out, for you will come up now and then and see how we are getting on, and we shall so look forward to your visits. Grandmama mounted her sturdy animal, and Uncle took the bridle to lead her down the steep mountain path, she begged him not to come far with her but he insisted on seeing her safely as far as Dewarfly, for the way was precipitous and not without danger for the rider, he said. Grandmama did not care to stay alone in Dewarfly, and therefore decided to return to Regatz, and thence to make excursions up the mountain from time to time. Peter came down with his goats before Uncle had returned. As soon as the animals caught sight of Heidi they all came flocking towards her, and she, as well as Clara on her couch, were soon surrounded by the goats, pushing and poking their heads one over the other, while Heidi introduced each in turn by its name to her friend Clara. It was not long before the latter had made the long-wished-for acquaintance of Little Snowflake, the lively Greenfinch, and the well-behaved goats belonging to Grandfather, as well as of the many others, including the Grand Turk. Peter meanwhile stood apart looking on, and casting somewhat unfriendly glances towards Clara. When the two children called out, Good evening, Peter, he made no answer, but swung his stick angrily, as if wanting to cut the air in two, and then ran off with his goats after him. The climax to all the beautiful things that Clara had already seen upon the mountain came at the close of the day. As she lay on the large, soft bed in the hay loft, with Heidi near her, she looked out through the round, open window right into the middle of the shining clusters of stars, and she exclaimed in delight. Heidi, it's just as if we were in a high carriage and were going to drive straight into heaven. Yes, and do you know why the stars are so happy and look down and nod to us like that? asked Heidi. No, why is it? Clara asked in return. Because they live up in heaven, and know how well God arranges everything for us, so that we need have no more fear or trouble and may be quite sure that all things will come right in the end. But then we must never forget to pray, and to ask God to remember us when he is arranging things, so that we too may feel safe and have no anxiety about what is going to happen. The two children now sat up and said their prayers, and then Heidi put her head down on her little round arm and fell off to sleep at once but Clara lay awake some time, 
for she could not get over the wonder of this new experience of being in bed up here among the stars. She had indeed seldom seen a star, for she never went outside the house at night, and the curtains at home were always drawn before the stars came out. Each time she closed her eyes she felt she must open them again to see if the two very large stars were still looking in, and nodding to her as Heidi said they did. There they were, always in the same place. At last her eyes closed of their own accord, and it was only in her dreams that she still saw the two large, friendly stars shining down upon her. Chapter 21 Happy Days for the Little Visitor Next morning at sunrise Olm Uncle went softly up the ladder to see if the children were awake yet. Clara had just opened her eyes and was looking with wonder at the bright sunlight that shone through the round window and danced and sparkled about her bed. She could not at first think where she was, until she caught sight of Heidi sleeping beside her, and heard the grandfather's cheery voice asking her if she had slept well. She assured him that when she had once fallen asleep she had not opened her eyes again all night. The grandfather was satisfied at this and immediately began to help her dress with so much gentleness and understanding that it seemed as if his chief calling had been to look after sick children. When Heidi awoke she was surprised to see Clara dressed, and already in the grandfather's arms ready to be carried down. She hurried up to and soon ran down the ladder and out of the hut, and their further astonishment awaited her, for grandfather had been busy the night before after they were in bed. Seeing that it was impossible to get Clara's chair through the hut door, he had taken down two of the boards at the side of the shed and made an opening large enough to admit the chair, these he left loose so that they could be taken away and put up at pleasure. He was at this moment wheeling Clara out into the sun, he left her in front of the hut while he went to look after the goats and Heidi ran up to her friend. Oh Heidi, if only I could stay up here forever with you, exclaimed Clara happily turning in her chair from side to side that she might drink in the air and sun from all quarters. Now you see that it is just what I told you, replied Heidi delighted, that it is the most beautiful thing in the world to be up here with grandfather. The latter at that moment appeared coming from the goat shed and bringing two small foaming bowls of snow white milk, one for Clara and one for Heidi. That will do the little daughter good, he said, nodding to Clara, it is from a little swan and will make her strong. To your health, child. Drink it up. Clara had never tasted goat's milk before, she hesitated and smelt it before putting it to her lips, but seeing how Heidi drank hers up without hesitating, and how much she seemed to like it, Clara did the same, and drank till there was not a drop left, for she too found it delicious, tasting just as if sugar and cinnamon had been mixed with it. Tomorrow we will drink too said the grandfather, who had looked on with satisfaction at seeing her follow Heidi's example. When Peter arrived with the goats, uncle drew him aside and said, from today be sure you let little swan go where she likes. She knows where to find the best food for herself, and so if she wants to climb higher, you follow her, and it will do the others no harm if they go too. A little more climbing won't hurt you, and in this matter she probably knows better than you what is good for her, I want her to give as fine milk as possible. So now be off and remember what I say, and don't look so cross about it. Peter was accustomed to give immediate obedience to uncle, and he marched off with his goats, but with a turn of the head and roll of the eye that showed he had some thought in reserve. The goats carried Heidi along with them a little way, which was what Peter wanted. You will have to come with them, he called to her, for I shall be obliged to follow little swan. I cannot, Heidi called back from the midst of her friends, and I shall not be able to come for a long, long time, not as long as Clara is with me. Grandfather, however, has promised to go up the mountain with both of us some day. As Heidi ran back to Clara, Peter doubled his fists and made threatening gestures towards the invalid on her couch, and then climbed up some distance without pause until he was out of sight, for he was afraid uncle might have seen him. Clara and Heidi had made so many plans for themselves that they hardly knew where to begin. Heidi suggested that they should first write to Grandmama, to whom they had promised to send word every day, for Grandmama had not felt sure whether it would in the long run suit Clara's health to remain up the mountain. With daily news of her granddaughter she could stay on without anxiety at regards, 
and yet be ready to go to Clara at a moment's notice. Must we go indoors to write? asked Clara. It is so much nicer out here. So Heidi ran in and brought out her school book and writing things and her own little stool. She put her reading book and copy book on Clara's knees, to make a desk for her to write upon, and she herself took her seat on the stool by the bench, and then they both began writing to Grandmama. But Clara paused after every sentence to look about her, it was too beautiful for much letter writing. The breeze had sunk a little, and now only gently fanned her face and whispered lightly through the fir trees. Now and again the call of some shepherd boy rang out through the air, and the echo answered softly from the rocks. Thus the morning 194, passed, the children hardly knew how, and soon grandfather came with the midday bowls of steaming milk. Then Heidi pushed Clara's chair under the fir trees, where they spent the afternoon in the shade, telling each other all that had happened since last they met. So the hours flew by and all at once, as it seemed, the evening had come with the returning Peter, who still scowled and looked angry. Good night, Peter, called out Heidi, as she saw he had no intention of stopping to speak. Good night, Peter, called out Clara in a friendly voice. Peter took no notice and went surlily on with his goats. As Clara saw the grandfather leading away little swan to milk her, she was suddenly taken with a longing for another bowl full of the fragrant milk, and waited impatiently for it. Isn't it curious, Heidi, she said, astonished at herself, as long as I can remember I have only eaten because I was obliged to, and everything used to seem to taste of cod liver oil and I was always wishing there was no need to eat or drink, and now I am longing for grandfather to bring me the milk. Yes, I know what it feels like, replied Heidi, who remembered the many days in Frankfurt when all her food used to seem to stick in her throat. When grandfather at last brought the evening milk, Clara drank it up so quickly that she had emptied her bowl before Heidi, and then she asked for a little more. The grandfather went inside with both the children's bowls, and when he brought them out again full he had something else to add to their supper. He had walked over that afternoon to a herdsman's house where the sweetly tasting butter was made, and had brought home a large pat, some of which he had now spread thickly on two good slices of bread. That night, when Clara lay down in her bed and prepared to watch the stars, her eyes would not keep open, and she fell asleep as soon as Heidi and slept soundly all night, a thing she never remembered having done before. The following day and the day after passed in the same pleasant fashion, and the third day there came a surprise for the children. Two stout porters came up the mountain, each carrying a bed on his shoulders with bedding of all kinds and two beautiful new white coverlids. The men also had a letter with them from Grandmama, in which she said that these were for Clara and Heidi and that Heidi in future was always to sleep in a proper bed, and when she went down to do a flea in the winter she was to take one with her and leave the other at the hut, so that Clara might always know there was a bed ready for her when she paid a visit to the mountain. She went on to thank the children for their long letters and encourage them to continue writing daily, so that she might be able to picture all they were doing. Grandfather went up the ladder and threw back the hay from Heidi's bed onto the great heap, and soon the beds were put up close to one another so that the children might still be able to see out of the window, for he knew what pleasure they had in the light from the sun and stars. Meanwhile Grandmama down at Regards was rejoicing at the excellent news of the invalid which reached her daily from the mountain. Clara found the life more charming each day and could not say enough of the kindness and care which the grandfather lavished upon her, nor of Heidi's lively and amusing companionship. Having such fresh assurances each day that all was going well with Clara, Grandmama thought she might put off her visit to the children a little longer, for the steep ride up and down was somewhat of a fatigue to her. The grandfather seemed to feel an especial sympathy for his little invalid charge, for he tried to think of something fresh every day to help forward her recovery. He climbed up the mountain every afternoon, higher and higher each day and came home in the evening with large bunches of leaves which scented the air with a mingled fragrance as of carnations and thyme. He hung them up in the goat shed for little swan to eat so that she might give extra fine milk. Clara had now been on the mountain for three weeks. For some days past the grandfather, each morning after carrying her down, 
had said, won't the little daughter try if she can stand for a minute or two? And Clara had made the effort in order to please him, but had clung to him as soon as her feet touched the ground, exclaiming that it hurt her so. He let her try a little longer, however, each day. It was many years since they had had such a splendid summer among the mountains. Day after day there were the same cloudless sky and brilliant sun, the flowers opened wide their fragrant blossoms, and everywhere the eye was greeted with a glow of color, and when the evening came the crimson light fell on mountain peaks and on the great snow field, till at last the sun sank in a sea of golden flame. Heidi never tired of telling Clara of the beauty of the spot on the higher slope of the mountain, where the bright golden rock roses grew in masses, and the blue flowers were in such numbers that the very grass seemed to have turned blue. An irrepressible longing came over her to see it all once more. She ran to her grandfather, who was in the shed, calling out almost before she was inside. Grandfather, will you take us out with the goats tomorrow? Oh, it is so lovely up there now. Very well, he answered, but if I do, little Clara must do something to please me, she must try her best again this evening to stand on her feet. Heidi ran back with the good news to Clara, and the latter promised to try her very best as the grandfather wished, for she looked forward immensely to the next day's excursion. Heidi was so pleased and excited that she called out to Peter as soon as she caught sight of him that evening. Peter, Peter, we are all coming out with you tomorrow and are going to stay up there the whole day. Peter, cross as a bear, grumbled some reply, and lifted his stick to give Greenfinch a blow for no reason in particular, but Greenfinch saw the movement, and with a leap over snowflakes back she got out of the way, and the stick only hit the air. Clara and Heidi got into their two fine beds that night full of delightful anticipation of the morrow, they were so full of their plans that they agreed to keep awake all night and talk over them. But their heads had no sooner touched their soft pillows than the conversation suddenly ceased, and Clara fell into a dream of an immense field, which looked the color of the sky, so thickly inlaid was it with blue, bell-shaped flowers, and Heidi heard the great bird of prey calling to her from the heights above, Come! 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 Chapter 22 Wicked Peter and the Unlucky Chair Uncle went out early the next morning to see what kind of a day it was going to be. There was a reddish gold light over the higher peaks, a light breeze was springing up and the branches of the fir trees moved gently to and fro, the sun was on its way. He wheeled the chair out of the shed ready for the coming journey, and then went in to call the children and tell them what a lovely sunrise it was. Peter came up the mountain at this moment. The goats did not gather round him so trustfully as usual, but seemed to avoid him timidly, for he had reached a high pitch of anger and bitterness, and was using his stick very unnecessarily, and where it fell the blow was no light one. For weeks now he had not had Heidi all to himself as formerly. When he came up in the morning the invalid child was always already in her chair and Heidi fully occupied with her. And it was the same thing over again when he came down in the evening. She had not come out with the goats once this summer, and today she was only coming in company with her friend and the chair, and would stick by the latter's side the whole time. It was the thought of this which was making him particularly cross this morning. There stood the chair on its high wheels. Peter glared at it as at an enemy that had done him harm and was likely to do him still more today. He glanced round, there was no sound anywhere, no one to see him. He sprang forward like a wild creature, caught hold of the chair, and gave it a violent and angry push in the direction of the slope. It rolled swiftly forward and in another minute had disappeared. Peter now sped up the mountain as if on wings, not pausing till he was well hidden behind a large blackberry bush, for he had no wish to be seen by uncle. But he was anxious to see what had become of the chair, so he looked, and there he saw his enemy running faster and faster downhill, then it turned head over heels several times, and finally, after one great bound, rolled over and over to its complete destruction. The pieces flew in every direction, feet, arms, and torn fragments of the padded seat and bolster, and Peter experienced a feeling of such unbounded delight at the sight that he leapt in the air, laughing aloud and stamping for joy. He could see only good results for himself in the disaster to his enemy. Now Heidi's friend would be obliged to go away, 
for she would have no means of going about, and when Heidi was alone again she would come out with him as in the old days, and everything would go on in the proper way. But Peter did not consider, or did not know, that when we do a wrong thing trouble is sure to follow. Heidi now came running out of the hut and round the shed. Grandfather was behind with Clara in his arms. The shed stood wide open, the two loose planks having been taken down, and it was quite light inside. Heidi looked into every corner and ran from one end to the other, and then stood still wondering what could have happened to the chair. Grandfather now came up. How is this, have you wheeled the chair away, Heidi? I have been looking everywhere for it, Grandfather, you said it was standing ready outside, and she again searched each corner of the shed with her eyes. At that moment the wind, which had risen suddenly, blew open the shed door and sent it banging back against the wall. It must have been the wind, Grandfather, exclaimed Heidi, and her eyes grew anxious at this sudden discovery. Oh! If it has blown the chair all the way down to do a flea we shall not get it back in time, and shall not be able to go. If it has rolled as far as that it will never come back, for it is in a hundred pieces by now, said the Grandfather, going round the corner and looking down. But it's a curious thing to have happened. He added as he thought over the matter, for the chair would have had to turn a corner before starting downhill. Oh, I am sorry, lamented Clara, for we shall not be able to go today, or perhaps any other day. I shall have to go home, I suppose, if I have no chair. Oh, I am so sorry, I am so sorry. But Heidi looked towards her grandfather with her usual expression of confidence. Grandfather, you will be able to do something, won't you? so that it need not be as Clara says, and so that she is not obliged to go home. Well, for the present we will go up the mountain as we had arranged, and then later on we will see what can be done, he answered, much to the children's delight. He went indoors, carried out a pile of shawls, and laying them on the sunniest spot he could find set Clara down upon them. Then he brought the children's morning milk and led out his two goats. Why is Peter not here yet? thought uncle to himself, for Peter's whistle had not been sounded that morning. The grandfather then took Clara up on one arm, and the shawls on the other. Now then we will start, he said, the goats can come with us. Heidi was pleased at this and walked on after her grandfather with an arm over either of the goats' necks, and the animals were so overjoyed to have her again that they nearly squeezed her flat between them out of sheer affection. When they reached the spot where the goats usually pastured they were surprised to find them already feeding there, climbing about the rocks, and Peter with them, lying his full length on the ground. I'll teach you another time to go by like that, you lazy rascal. What do you mean by it? Uncle called to him. Peter, recognizing the voice, jumped up like a shot. No one was up, he answered. Have you seen anything of the chair? asked the grandfather. Of what chair? called Peter back in answer in a morose tone of voice. Uncle said no more. He spread the shawls on the sunny slope, and setting Clara upon them asked if she was comfortable. As comfortable as in my chair, she said, thanking him, and this seems the most beautiful spot. Oh Heidi, it is lovely, it is lovely! she cried, looking round her with delight. The grandfather prepared to leave them. They would now be safe and happy together he said, and when it was time for dinner Heidi was to go and bring the bag from the shady hollow where he had put it, Peter was to get them as much milk as they wanted, but Heidi was to see that it was little swan's milk. He would come for them towards evening, he must now be off to see after the chair and find out what had become of it. The sky was dark blue, and not a single cloud was to be seen from one horizon to the other. The great snowfield overhead sparkled as if set with thousands and thousands of gold and silver stars. Now and again a young goat came and lay down beside them, Snowflake came oftenest, putting her little head down near Heidi, and only moving because another goat came and drove her away. And the goats had also grown familiar with Clara and would rub their heads against her shoulder, which was always a sign of acquaintanceship and goodwill. Some hours went by, and Heidi began to think that she might just go over to the spot where all the flowers grew to see if they were fully blown and looking as lovely as the year before. 
Clara could not go until Grandfather came back that evening, when the flowers probably would be already closed. The longing to go became stronger and stronger, till Heidi felt she could not resist it. Would you think me unkind, Clara, she said rather hesitatingly, if I left you for a few minutes? I could run there and back very quickly. I want so to see how the flowers are looking, but wait, for an idea had come into Heidi's head. She ran and picked a bunch or two of green leaves, and then took hold of Snowflake and led her up to Clara. There, now you will not be alone, said Heidi, giving the goat a little push to show her she was to lie down near Clara, which the animal quite understood. Heidi threw the leaves into Clara's lap, and the latter told her friend to go at once to look at the flowers as she was quite happy to be left with the goat, she liked this new experience. Heidi ran off, and Clara began to hold out the leaves one by one to Snowflake, who snuggled up to her new friend in a confiding manner and slowly ate the leaves from her hand. She found a strange new pleasure in sitting all alone like this on the mountainside, her only companion a little goat that looked to her for protection. She suddenly felt a great desire to be her own mistress and to be able to help others, instead of herself being always dependent as she was now. Many thoughts, unknown to her before, came crowding into her mind, and a longing to go on living in the sunshine, and to be doing something that would bring happiness to another, as now she was helping to make the goat happy. An unaccustomed feeling of joy took possession of her, as if everything she had ever known or felt became all at once more beautiful, and she seemed to see all things in a new light, and so strong was the sense of this new beauty and happiness that she threw her arms round the little goat's neck, and exclaimed, Oh snowflake, how delightful it is up here! If only I could stay on forever with you beside me! Heidi had meanwhile reached her field of flowers, and as she caught sight of it she uttered a cry of joy. The whole ground in front of her was a mass of shimmering gold, where the sisters' flowers spread their yellow blossoms. Above them waved whole bushes of the deep bluebell flowers. Heidi stood and gazed and drew in the delicious air. Suddenly she turned round and reached Clara's side out of breath with running and excitement. Oh, you must come, she called out as soon as she came in sight, it is more beautiful than you can imagine, and perhaps this evening it may not be so lovely. I believe I could carry you, don't you think I could? Clara looked at her and shook her head. Why, Heidi, what can you be thinking of? You are smaller than I am. Oh, if only I could walk. Heidi looked round as if in search of something, some new idea had evidently come into her head. Peter was sitting up above looking down on the two children. He had been sitting and staring before him in the same way for hours, as if he could not make out what he saw. He had destroyed the chair so that the friend might not be able to move anywhere and that her visit might come to an end, and then a little while after she had appeared right up here under his very nose with Heidi beside her. He thought his eyes must deceive him, and yet there she was and no mistake about it. Heidi looked up to where he was sitting and called out in a commanding voice, Peter, come down here. I don't wish to come, he called in reply. But you must, I cannot do it alone, and you must come here and help me, make haste and come down, she called again in an urgent voice. I shall do nothing of the kind, was the answer. Heidi ran some way up the slope towards him, and then pausing called again, her eyes ablaze with anger, if you don't come at once, Peter, I will do something to you that you won't like, I mean what I say. Peter felt an inward throw at these words, and a great fear seized him. He had done something wicked which he wanted no one to know about, and so far he had thought himself safe. But now Heidi spoke exactly as if she knew everything, and whatever she did know she would tell her grandfather, and there was no one he feared so much as this latter person. Supposing he were to suspect what had happened about the chair. Peter's anguish of mind grew more acute. He stood up and went down to where Heidi was awaiting him. I am coming, and you won't do what you said. Peter appeared now so submissive with fear that Heidi felt quite sorry for him and answered assuringly, No, no, of course not, come along with me, there is nothing to be afraid of in what I want you to do. As soon as they got to Clara, Heidi gave her orders, Peter was to take hold of her under the arms on one side and she on the other, and together they were to lift her up. 
This first movement was successfully carried through, but then came the difficulty. As Clara could not even stand, how were they to support her and get her along? Heidi was too small for her arm to serve Clara to lean upon. You must put one arm well round my neck, so, and put the other through Peter's and lean firmly upon it, then we shall be able to carry you. Peter, however, had never given his arm to anyone in his life. Clara put hers in his, but he kept his own hanging down straight beside him like a stick. That's not the way, Peter, said Heidi in an authoritative voice. You must put your arm out in the shape of a ring, and Clara must put hers through it and lean her weight upon you, and whatever you do, don't let your arm give way, like that I am sure we shall be able to manage. Peter did as he was told, but still they did not get on very well. Clara was not such a light weight, and the team did not match very well in size, it was up one side and down the other, so that the supports were rather wobbly. Clara tried to use her own feet a little, but each time drew them quickly back. Put your foot down firmly once, suggested Heidi, I am sure it will hurt you less after that. Do you think so, said Clara hesitatingly, but she followed Heidi's advice and ventured one firm step on the ground and then another, she called out a little as she did it, then she lifted her foot again and went on, oh, that was less painful already, she exclaimed joyfully. Try again, said Heidi encouragingly. And Clara went on putting one foot out after another until all at once she called out, I can do it, Heidi. Look, look, I can make proper steps. And Heidi cried out with even greater delight, Can you really make steps, can you really walk? Really walk by yourself? Oh, if only grandfather were here. And she continued gleefully to exclaim, You can walk now, Clara, you can walk. Clara still held on firmly to her supports, but with every step she felt safer on her feet, as all three became aware, and Heidi was beside herself with joy. Now we shall be able to come up here together every day, and just go where we like, and you will be able to walk about as I do, and not have to be pushed in a chair, and will get quite strong and well. It is the greatest happiness we could have had. And Clara heartily agreed, for she could think of no greater joy in the world than to be strong and able to go about like other people, and no longer to have to lie from day to day in her invalid chair. They had not far to go to reach the field of flowers, and could already catch sight of the sister's flowers glowing gold in the sun. As they came to the bushes of the blue bell flowers, with sunny, inviting patches of warm ground between them, Clara said, Can't we sit down here for a while? This was just what Heidi enjoyed, and so the children sat down in the midst of the flowers, Clara for the first time on the dry, warm mountain grass, and she found it indescribably delightful. Everything was so lovely. So lovely. And Heidi, who was beside her, thought she had never seen it so perfectly beautiful up here before. Then she suddenly remembered that Clara was cured that was the crowning delight of all that made life so delightful in the midst of all this surrounding beauty. Clara sat silent, overcome with the enchantment of all that her eye rested upon, and with the anticipation of all the happiness that was now before her. There seemed hardly room in her heart for all her joyful emotions. Peter also lay among the flowers without moving or speaking, for he was fast asleep. The breeze came blowing softly and caressingly from behind the sheltering rocks, and passed whisperingly through the bushes overhead. Heidi got up now and then to run about, for the flowers waving in the warm wind seemed to smell sweeter and to grow more thickly whichever way she went. So the hours went by. It was long past noon when a small troop of goats advanced solemnly towards the plain of flowers. It was not a feeding place of theirs for they did not care to graze on flowers. They looked like an embassy arriving, with Greenfinch as their leader. They had evidently come in search of their companions who had left them in the lurch, and who had remained away so long, for the goats could tell the time without mistake. As soon as Greenfinch caught sight of the three missing friends amid the flowers she set up an extra loud bleat, whereupon all the others joined in a chorus of bleats, and the whole company came trotting towards the children. Peter woke up, rubbing his eyes, 
for he had been dreaming that he saw the chair again with its beautiful red padding standing whole and uninjured before the grandfather's door. He experienced again the dreadful fear of mind that he had lost in this dream of the uninjured chair. Even though Heidi had promised not to do anything, there still remained the lively dread that his deed might be found out in some other way. He allowed Heidi to do what she liked with him, for he was reduced to such a state of low spirits and meekness that he was ready to give his help to Clara without murmur or resistance. When all three had got back to their old quarters Heidi ran and brought forward the bag, and proceeded to fulfill her promise, for her threat of the morning had been concerned with Peter's dinner. She had seen her grandfather putting in all sorts of good things, and had been pleased to think of Peter having a large share of them, and she had meant him to understand when he refused at first to help her that he would get nothing for his dinner, but Peter's conscience had put another interpretation upon her words. Heidi took the food out of the bag and divided it into three portions, and each was of such a goodly size that she thought to herself, there will be plenty of hours left for him to have more still. She gave the other two their dinners and sat down with her own beside Clara, and they all three ate with a good appetite after their great exertions. Peter ate up every bit of food to the last crumb, but there was something wanting to his usual enjoyment of a good dinner, for every mouthful he swallowed seemed to choke him, and he felt something gnawing inside him. They were so late at their dinner that they had not long to wait after they had finished before Grandfather came up to get them. Heidi rushed forward to meet him as soon as he appeared, as she wanted to be the first to tell him the good news. She was so excited that she could hardly get her words out when she did get up to him, but he soon understood, and a look of extreme pleasure came into his face. He hastened up to where Clara was sitting and said with a cheerful smile, So, we've made the effort, have we, and won the day. Then he lifted her up and putting his left arm behind her and giving her his right to lean upon, made her walk a little way, which she did with less trembling and hesitation than before, now that she had such a strong arm round her. Heidi skipped along beside her in glee, and the grandfather looked too as if some happiness had befallen him. We must not overdo it, he said taking Clara up in his arms. It is high time we went home, and he started off down the mountain path, for he was anxious to get her indoors that she might rest after her unusual fatigue. When Peter got to Dewifly that evening he found a large group of people collected round a certain spot, pushing one another and looking over each other's shoulders in their eagerness to catch sight of something lying on the ground. Peter thought he should like to see too, and poked and elbowed till he made his way through. There it lay, the thing he had wanted to see. Scattered about the grass were the remains of Clara's chair, part of the back and the middle bit, and enough of the red padding and the bright nails to show how magnificent the chair had been when it was entire. I was here when the men passed carrying it up, said the baker, who was standing near Peter. I'll bet anyone that it was worth one hundred and twenty-five dollars at least. I cannot think how such an accident could have happened. Uncle said the wind might perhaps have done it, remarked one of the women. It's a good job that no one but the wind did it, said the baker again, or he might smart for it. No doubt the gentleman in Frankfurt when he hears what has happened will make inquiries about it. I am glad for myself that I have not been seen up the mountain for a good two years, as suspicion is likely to fall on anyone who was up there at the time. Many more opinions were passed on the matter, but Peter had heard enough. He crept quietly away out of the crowd and then took to his heels and ran up home as fast as he could, as if he thought someone was after him. The baker's words had filled him with fear and trembling. He was sure now that any day a constable might come over from Frankfurt and inquire about the destruction of the chair, and then everything would come out, and he would be seized and carried off to Frankfurt and there put in prison. He reached home in this disturbed state of mind. He would not open his mouth in reply to anything that was said to him, he would not eat his potatoes, all he did was to creep off to bed as quickly as possible and hide under the bedclothes and groan. Peter has been eating sorrel again, and is evidently in pain by the way he is groaning, said his mother. You must give him a little more bread to take with him, 
give him a bit of mine tomorrow, said the grandmother sympathizingly. As the children lay that night in bed looking out at the stars Heidi said, I have been thinking all day what a happy thing it is that God does not give us what we ask for, even when we pray and pray and pray, if he knows there is something better for us, have you felt like that? Why do you ask me that tonight all of a sudden? asked Clara. Because I prayed so hard when I was in Frankfurt that I might go home at once, and because I was not allowed to I thought God had forgotten me. And now you see, if I had come away at first when I wanted to, you would never have come here, and would never have got well. Clara had in her turn become thoughtful. But, Heidi, she began again, in that case we ought never to pray for anything, as God always intends something better for us than we know or wish for. You must not think it is like that, Clara, replied Heidi eagerly. We must go on praying for everything, so that God may know we do not forget that it all comes from Him. If we forget God, then He lets us go our own way and we get into trouble. How did you learn all that? asked Clara. Grandmama explained it to me first of all, and then when it all happened just as she said, I knew it myself, and I think, Clara, she went on, as she sat up in bed, we ought certainly to thank God tonight that you can walk now, and that he has made us so happy. Yes, Heidi, I am sure you are right, and I am glad you reminded me, I almost forgot my prayers for very joy. Both children said their prayers, and each thanked God in her own way for the blessing he had bestowed on Clara, who had for so long lay in weak and ill. The next morning the grandfather suggested that they should now write to the grandmama and ask her if she would not come and pay them a visit, as they had something new to show her. But the children had another plan in their heads, for they wanted to prepare a great surprise for grandmama. Clara was first to have more practice in walking so that she might be able to go a little way by herself, above all things grandmama was not to have a hint of it. They asked the grandfather how long he thought this would take, and when he told them about a week or less, they immediately sat down and wrote a pressing invitation to Grandmama, asking her to come soon, but no word was said about there being anything new to see. The following days were some of the most joyous that Clara had spent on the mountain. She awoke each morning with a happy voice within her crying, I am well now. I am well now. I shan't have to go about in a chair, I can walk by myself like other people. Then came the walking, and every day she found it easier and was able to go a longer distance. The movement gave her such an appetite that the grandfather cut his bread and butter a little thicker each day, and was well pleased to see it disappear. He brought out the foaming milk in a larger jug so he could fill the little bowls over and over again. And so another week went by and the day came which was to bring Grandmum up the mountain for her second visit.